If you get your views from television news, you'll only hear stories that corporations choose. You'll only get to see what they want you to see. You're gonna have to read and decide what you believe. We all watched in horror 911. The planes hit the towers and the towers came down. Did you ever wonder how they fell so fast? Well, maybe that's a question that we're not supposed to ask. Hi, and welcome to another episode of 9-11 was an inside job. I'm here in the control room of Studio B because Studio A got preempted. I forgot it's not a live show today. So I'm going to show you a series of clips to catch up on some things. First of all, we're going to show you the uh, uh, David Chandler third in the series of the uh, NIST series where he got NIST to retract their statement that there was no free fall, got them to admit to free fall. And uh, this is the, probably the most important part of it where the importance of free fall, the significance of free fall of Building 7 is, is explained. I spent a lot of time on the blogs lately arguing with people, it's kind of strange to have to do that, about principles of science that should be basic. I mean, basic high school physics. Well, we're just going to go ahead now and switch to this David Chandler video. It's about 15 minutes long, and then I'll be back with a Bob Bowman must-see video and follow that up with something about the economy. So here we go, um, and take it away, Dave. Okay, part three of this series actually uh, is what I was intending to do as part two. This is going to spell out the implications of NIST's admission that Building 7 went through a period of freefall. Shyam Sundar is the lead investigator for the NIST analysis of the collapse of World Trade Center Building 7. In the technical briefing on August 26th, Dr. Sundar clearly explained why freefall for World Trade Center 7 was impossible. The analysis show there's a difference in time between a free fall time. A free fall time would be an object that has no uh, structural components below it. And that is not at all unusual because there, there was a structural resistance that was provided in this particular case. And you had, uh, you had a sequence of structural failures that had to take place and where everything was not instantaneous. That was before they were forced to acknowledge that free fall actually occurred. Once they acknowledged freefall, they claimed without elaboration that their new analysis was consistent with the results of the global collapse analysis. I'm not making this up. This is their own words. Freefall time would be an object that has no uh, structural components below it. Sunder's original remarks make sense under the assumption of a natural collapse. Anything at an elevated height has gravitational potential energy. If it falls and none of the energy is used for other things along the way, all of that energy is converted into kinetic energy, the energy of motion, and we call it free fall. If any of the energy is used for other purposes, there will be less kinetic energy, so the fall will be slower. In the case of a falling building, the only way it can go into free fall is if an external force removes the supporting structure. None of the gravitational potential energy of the building is available for this purpose, or it would slow the fall of the building. The fact of freefall by itself is strong evidence of explosive demolition, but the evidence is even stronger than that. My original analysis looks like this. I have since confirmed my measurement using a different software package. Both of these graphs plot velocity versus time. 
A straight line indicates constant acceleration, and the slope of the line indicates the rate of acceleration. What is particularly striking is the suddenness of onset of freefall. The acceleration doesn't build up gradually. The graph simply turns a corner. The building went from full support to zero support instantly. NIST's graph is upside down relative to mine, but that's really not an issue. Their data is almost the same. What is dramatically different is the curve they superimpose on the data. This curve has no physical significance whatsoever. It is merely a hypothetical interpretation of the data. It is literally the mathematical equivalent of laying a wet noodle on the graph and nudging it around until it fits the data. The straight part fits the data reasonably well. What is totally misleading are the gradual transitions into and out of free fall. The raw data speaks for itself. One moment the building is holding, the next moment it lets go and is in complete free fall. The onset of free fall was not only sudden, it extended across the whole width of the building. My measurement of the acceleration of the building was based on the northwest corner. This recent measurement confirming free fall was based on a point midway along the roof line. The fact that the roof stayed level shows the building was in free fall across the entire width. The collapse we see cannot be due to a column failure or a few column failures or a sequence of column failures. All 24 interior columns and 58 perimeter columns had to have been removed over the span of eight floors low in the building simultaneously to within a small fraction of a second, and in such a way that the top half of the building remains intact and uncrumpled. Let's come back to NIST's acceptance of freefall. Here is their exact wording. Quote, the three stages of collapse progression described above are consistent with the results of the global collapse analysis discussed in Chapter 12 of NIST NC Star 1-9. Unquote. In other words, they're giving the appearance of claiming free fall is okay, but actually it's the 5.4 second duration of their three-stage analysis that matches their model. But we saw in part two of this video series that the 5.4 seconds depends on an artificially early start time, which has no valid observational basis. Without the 5.4 second fig leaf, they are left with free fall and nothing more. NIST does not show how free fall is consistent with their hypothesis, because, as Shyam Sundar has correctly and eloquently explained, free fall for a naturally collapsing building is impossible. This brings us to their computer model. NIST's so-called investigation actually consists of finding a way to reproduce the mysterious collapse of the building using a computer model. The assumption is that if the computer model can be made to reproduce the observed collapse pattern, that must be how it happened. The problem is, if something unexpected was going on, like explosives for instance, you're not going to discover it in the computer model. For that, you need to look at the actual evidence. So why not examine the steel directly? Oh yes, there isn't any. At least there isn't any after it was hauled away to Asia and melted down. NIST's investigation has been compared to conducting an autopsy without the corpse. As of 2005, NIST reported having only 236 pieces of steel from the World Trade Center complex, none of them unambiguously identified as being from World Trade Center 7. We've all watched CSI. Anyone serious about solving a crime knows the importance of physical evidence. Yet here the crime scene was scrubbed, the evidence was destroyed, and the investigation was delayed for years. Destroying a crime scene is itself a criminal act. Destroying the steel has absolutely no justification except to cover up the cause of the collapse. So even if we knew nothing else about the events of that day, we can see immediately there was a cover-up. Knowing there was a cover-up is a strong indication there was a crime someone wanted covered up. Any investigation that does not acknowledge this basic fact is not really an investigation. It's an extension of the cover-up. NIST claims their computer model can account for the observed phenomena. So let's look at NIST's model, except we can't. The software they use to do the modeling is available, but their model actually consists of all the numbers and measurements and assumptions, together with any tweaks to the system they might have used to get it to come out the way they wanted. If that information were released, their results could be checked by anyone with the appropriate skills and software tools. But NIST has not released the numbers. All we've been shown are some of the selected animated outputs they were able to get their model to produce. Is their model realistic? We don't know. 
Some models are chaotic in the mathematical sense. In other words, tiny variations in the inputs might result in wildly different outcomes. Is NIST's model stable or chaotic? Realistic or contrived? Honest or fraudulent? We don't know. We can't know without independent testing. The very process of running the model until it produces the kind of result you're looking for is called selection bias. If you think about it, NIST's methodology is explicitly based on selection bias. Even if you could show what might have happened, it doesn't show what actually did happen. The very fact that NIST has not released their model strongly suggests they don't want their results checked. In other words, their results are intended to be taken strictly on faith. If NIST has not released their modeling data and their assumptions, they have really not released their report. And the fact that this is their final report indicates they do not intend to do so. Therefore, on the face of it, their report is little more than a fancy, expensive cover-up. One fact we do know about NIST's model is it does not allow for freefall. The best they could do is 5.4 seconds for the building to crumple down through 18 floors. Crumpling absorbs energy, and that makes freefall impossible. There's nothing in the models we have been shown that even resemble a three-stage collapse with a freefall component. After all, as Shyam Sundar put it himself, Free fall happens only when there are no structural components below the falling section of the building. Any natural scenario is going to involve a progression of failures, and these don't happen instantaneously. So, in the end, we come back to where we were in the beginning. On first impression, we were looking at a classic controlled demolition. NIST claimed to have found a way it could have happened naturally, but in fact, they failed. The only way they can support their claim is through lies, secrecy, and pompous but false pronouncements. That constitutes a failed agenda. Explosive demolition is the only scenario that has been put forward that could actually account for the observations. Where does that leave us? We have a building that underwent directly observable and now officially acknowledged freefall with no plausible mechanisms other than explosive demolition. We have an official investigation by a government agency that has fraudulently manipulated data has refused to even consider existing physical evidence that explosives were used. They have wrapped themselves and their data in secrecy and offered up pronouncements as conclusions to be taken on faith. The NIST investigation is a fraud and a farce. We need a new, fully empowered, truly independent, and open investigation. I've gotten a bit of adulation in the truth movement for having forced NIST to make this change, to admit freefall. And I want to set the record straight a little bit, but I also have some thoughts about this subject. First of all, it was not single-handedly. There were a number of people who submitted uh, requests for correction, is the term, in writing to NIST. I did, and several other people did as well. And um, Stephen Jones played a role right there in the conference, as you saw. So there, this was not um, just a single-handed anything. The other side of it is, I don't think that it's necessarily true that what I did there forced NIST to make this change. Because if you notice, Sham Sundar um, pretty much blew off my question. I mean, he talked all around it. Um, he eventually gave the rationale for why it couldn't have happened based on physical principles and so forth, but he basically could have just dropped it there and let it go. There are lots of lies in this document, and why not one more? Why did they feel necess it was necessary to come back and actually change their, um, their admission that it's free fall? Uh, I've been pondering this, and one of the things that I noticed was, if you look at the fact that when Stephen Jones asked his question, he asked, uh, why did you assume that it's constant speed versus constant acceleration? And in a sense, I, had, I noticed that same comment. I thought, it's hardly worth asking because it's clearly just a misstatement. Like, uh, it, in the very next paragraph, it says, I mean, there's an equation that's based on the assumption of constant acceleration. So it's clear that they weren't acting.